So today's webinar is about Pazza We Web Handlers. Um, despite the Tina Turner reference there, or the song I will not sing for you, I will not do that to anybody. Um, but Pazza We Web Handlers are have been around for some time now, um, and they are still fantastic. One of the one of the better, in my opinion, maybe not quite, maybe not the best, but certainly one of the better pieces of technology that Progress has provided in a good long while. Okay, with that. Right. Um, my name is Peter Judge. I work at Consulting Work. I've been there for a couple of years now after a long stint at Progress. Um, I've been working with uh, ABL, 4GL for coming up for 30 years now. Wow, that's a little scary. Um, and my background is frameworks, toolkits, applications. Um, I've worked a lot in PaaS. At my time at Progress, um, worked on HTTP client. Um, yeah, and I'm, you'll see me at PUGS, Progress Communities, these kinds of events, webinars. Um, yeah, all around the Progress world. Um, consulting Work is an independent IT consulting organization. For those of you who don't know us, we're focused mainly on open edge, but related technologies. So kind of the Progress open edge ecosystem, largely. Um, our head office is in Cologne in Germany, we've got subsidiaries in the UK and the US, um, Romania and customers in all of those places and very many more, um, South Africa, Australia, um, all over Europe, um, North America, all over North America as well. Um, as I said, we focus on open edge um, applications, modernization, um, goofy.net, we've done a lot of work, Angular um, front ends as well. Yeah, so the open edge stuff um, from front to back, um, Leric and Ultra Controls, Infogistic Controls, um, and a variety of other products also. Um, in addition to that, we also work, also have um, services around the related products and a bunch of stuff in kind of the DevOps world, working with all of those fun things, Docker and Jenkins and build pipelines and all of those things that you don't actually know you need until you need them, until you find you need them. So all around the open edge application space. Um, today, we're gonna look a little bit at an overview of Pazawi and web handlers. Um, where did they come from? What kind of are they? Configuring them, a little bit of coding on them, um, and then looking at, um, authorization and error handling. So configuration includes things about deployment as well. Um, there have been some changes in that space in the last couple of years, I should say. So what is a web handler? So web handler is a component or a piece of PASOE. PASOE, PAS 4 OE as Progress likes to call it, um, is the application server for Open Edge. It's Tomcat based. Um, it was introduced in 11.5, which is now many moons old. Um, yes, some time ago. Um, and in 11.5, there were three, well, technically four, what they call transports. Transports represent different kind of clients. So APSV is your open edge client, um, open client, ABL client, REST and SOAP. Um, so for SOAP, REST is the REST adapter, REST manager that was introduced in 11.2 by Progress, um, and a static transport. Um, and these are kind of represented by different URLs in or different uh, paths in the URL. So you'll see, um, makes it kind of easy to spot a uh, PASAWI URL when it's kind of public, similar like it was very easy to spot a web speed URL back in the day. And the web transport was added in 11.6. Um, and that's where web handlers came from, or when web handlers were introduced. Um, and in OpenEdge 12, I'm the only app server for OpenEdge. If you're not on PASA, well, you should really be getting on there pronto. Progress is stopping support for 11.7 next year, 2025 at some point. Um, and at that point, you will have to migrate to, to a version of 12, hopefully 12.8, which is the latest LTS just released at the beginning of this year. Um, but you'll need to move to PAS OE. Um, that can be an adventure in its own right, but that's a different story for a different day. All right, so that's PAS OE. Um, again, PAS OE is built 
um, on top of Tomcat. Um, it's 64-bit only on the server-side clients. It can support 32-bit clients just fine. Um, Progress ships some Docker images for development for production uh, containing Tomcat or sorry, containing PazOE. Um, and you basically just provide your licenses and your application and off you go. Um, built on top of Tomcat's important because it means that, or a consequence of it, I should say, is that um, PazOE doesn't come with some pieces that are in the classic app server pile, um, load balancing, failover stuff. You have to, I say, build those yourself, but you can use standard, standard-based things rather than open it to the name server and admin server. Um, at runtime, you don't need an admin server at all or open edge management at all. There's a thing called open edge manager, which is different from open edge management. Um, but you don't need to have those at all. Pezoe can run in kind of a lean, mean, just stand up and run it kind of environment, which is pretty nifty. All right. So web handlers. Available since 11.6. Um, they are classes. They have to be classes. Um, most other things in um, OpenEdge world, you can interact with procedures or classes, but for REST, they have to be procedure. I mean, sorry, they have to be classes with a particular um, with a particular form. Um, <clears throat> what they give you, and this is a really really good thing, is a very flexible way to handle web requests in ABL. Very flexible from a coding point of view but also very flexible from a deployment point of view. Um, very simple to configure as well. Um, unlike the REST adapter, which took a bit of work to get working, um, uh, writing, using the REST adapter, the REST mapping tool was not great in PDSOE. Um, PASOE web handlers are really nicely done, in my opinion. Um, basically, they handle any paths under slash web. So that slash web is, I mentioned the transport and there must be a slash web. Um, the stuff to the left of it can be your host and your web app, or whatever stuff to the right of it, you control, which is really neat, um, but it, it does have slash web in it. Once upon a time, there was people were asking whether it's possible to not use that. Um, and the way kind of to do that is with a URL rewrite in your Apache web server or maybe in Pazoe as well. One of the great things, or the other great things, is like kind of like web speed, um, web handlers let you consume and produce any kind of content type. So things like SOAP are limited to XML, whatever you can do in XML. The ABL is limited in the type of clients it has. Um, the REST adapter or the REST transport is limited to JSON, which means that if you want to use binary stuff, you've got to squish it into um, or base64 encode it to put it into a JSON blob. Um, web handlers let give you free reign to use any kind of web of content in or out. Um, follows the standard HTTP request re response pattern. So client, your browser, a REST client, um, a web app. GUI, I'm not a GUI, well, it could be a GUI, um, makes a request and a response is served back up by PASOE. Um, and in fact, as I mentioned, because we're not limited to the content type, you can use it to replace the REST adapter, very, very easily replace the REST adapter. Um, but also potentially if you wanted to, you felt this way inclined, you could, you could use it to consume SOAP as well. Um, Progress provided a couple of tools, um, in particular this web handler, progress.web.compatibility handler, and this is a drop-in, and I'll say drop-in, drop-in with quotes, drop-in with a star, there's a bunch of it depends, but a drop-in um, replacement for the old webdisp.p. Um, that pretty much provides classic web speed support out of the box. Um, in 12.8, 12 12.7, 12 um, Progress provided some support for mapped HTML objects, which was one missing piece. Um, but you can serve up existing um, web speed based um, applications, websites using PASOE, 
with this compatibility handler and you can just configure it to do so. Um, there was a thing I was going to say about web handlers that now escapes me. Oh, well, it'll come back to me. Um, yes, um, configure, it'll come back to me. Um, yeah, that was what it was. The one thing where um, Pazoe is different from classic web speed is that Pazoe in a sense behaves more like a app server rather than the web speed server. So what people I know would do would provide, would put wait for loops into kind of webdisk.p or the startup um, and use it um, that way. That model is, doesn't work anymore in Pazoe. Um, Pazoe, everything is just that synchronous request response. There's no, if you have a wait for inside of your um, web handler, the client is just going to sit there waiting for a response until it times out or until you return something. So that's um, something to be aware of. Um, there's something to be aware of. And that's in general with PASOE. Okay. So what is it? What does it do? Well, it's got basically two jobs. You can think of it in an OERA kind of architecture as a service interface, right? And a service interface's job is to receive a request from a particular kind of client. In this case, it's an HTTP client with, as I said, browser, whatever that might be, and turn it into a call into um, some business logic, a business service, a service, um, microservice, whatever you want to call it. Um, and take the response of that, take the result of that service call and return it out to the client. So turns HTTP into ABL, turns ABL into HTTP um, to and fro. Um, the other thing it does is where does it make that request, right? So a request comes to, um, you know, post something slash customers uh, with a blob of JSON. What program do you have to run to go and do that? So that's its other job. Uh, as I mentioned, web handlers are an OABL class. It's an implementation of this particular interface. It's got a very simple, um, it's got a single method in it, handle request, it returns an integer. You shouldn't really use that. Generally, you're going to use something that derives from OpenEdge Web Web Handler um, and extend that to add your functionality, extend that in a variety of ways. Um, there are two others, a compatibility handler I've touched on, which lets you run classic web speed, um, and then the default handler, which is intended to be a production default, and it just returns no. It just says, nope, you can't come in here. Just blocks every every request that comes in that's not handled by another web handler, it just gets blocked up. Um, they are shipped, these, these open edge.web classes and supporting classes are shipped um, in their path in progress, um, install TTY Netlib, um, and they're kind of in that Netlib or Open Edge NetPL because they're pretty much the other side of the coin from an HTTP client, right? The client makes requests and gets responses. Um, the web handler gets requests and makes responses. So, um, Open Edge Web Web Handler is your standard place to start. It's got a bunch of method in it that help you. Um, one for handle get, put, post, delete, a whole bunch of those. Um, they provide you with a object um, representation of the request. Um, there's some methods for dealing with problems, exceptions, handle not allowed, handle not implemented. Those bottom two are um, pretty much what are returned by that default handler if it runs into trouble or if, if, if it gets any requests. As I mentioned, same object model. If you've worked with ABL, HTTP client, you will be fairly, these classes will be familiar to you. Similarly, if you've worked with a web handler and you want to write ABL client code, HTTP client code the model, the classes will look very similar. Okay. So what can we do with this? Well, we can do a whole bunch of stuff, right? API data, right? So JSON, XML, multi-part images, uploads, downloads, um, MTOM, which is a kind of SOAP format. Um, anything really not streaming that's the one thing Paz doesn't do um or probably shouldn't do and <laughs> technically could tomcat but Paz doesn't really support audio or video streaming I mean, you can download an image download an audio file an mp3 or whatever it is download a um <clears throat> a video file 
as a binary blob, that's fine. Um, so API data is probably the most common use case um, for um, PASOE, right? It takes requests, probably RESTful ones, so expecting or receiving a JSON payload, goes and calls some business logic, does a thing, calculates tax, I don't know, updates customers, does something, and returns another blob of JSON or a status code that says, yep, everything's worked. That's most of the work. But again, can do so much more. So API documentation, right? um, generating or serving um, Swagger documents of those API endpoints, right, is a thing. Um, that's cool, right? Um, being able to show that. Building dynamic UIs, whether it's repository-based UI, um, like we have in the Smart Component Library, or dynamic HTML, kind of like classic um, web speed, right? It's not the modern way, but there are still a lot of websites that build, that work that way. And Web Handler can do all of these things. Other fun things, potentially um, tenancy-based routing. So you may have a PaaS server that sits um, um, outside of the firewall, gets an HTTP request, and turns that into a PaaSOE instance, which is inside of the firewall. So kind of it can convert those HTTP requests into and become itself an ABL client to another app server. Um, things like heartbeats or pulse checks, right? Ping requests. If you've got a um, PASOE server that's running in a container, you know, managed by Kubernetes or something, um, every X seconds it may get a ping. This is hello, am I here? And you want to return a 200 OK or something if you're not feeling well. Those kinds of things. So all kinds of a whole variety of things. Um, and yes, you can do this some of this stuff in different ways. But the cool thing for me in PASOE and with web handlers is that this is all in ABL. My background's ABL. I like working with it. And it's really nice to be able to just do stuff quick, quick in ABL and build um, a web handler. Um, yeah. So configuration of a web handler. So how do we how do we use them? As I mentioned, this is nice and simple. Well, start simple, can get complicated. Um, so from 11.6, there is um, configuration in the openedge.properties file. That's your standard in PaaS properties file. And it, it looks something, the configuration looks something like this. There's a, the word handler with a number equals the web handler name, colon, and a relative URI. Relative to web, again, must have those kinds of things. And you can have any number of them, right? From one to, I don't know, I don't know what the top end is. I've seen configurations with hundreds, hundreds of web handlers um, configured for an application. Um, they can have just text like customers, but they can also have tokens or path parameters is what they're called, um, which then get interpreted and passed into the web handler so you can use it. So you don't have to set up, you can get, if you have a URL that looks something like slash customers slash and the customer number, you don't necessarily have to set, you can get that customer number from the URL in a variable form with these tokens. Very nifty. The determination we'll go into in a sec um, of how it picks a web handler to use is kind of based on the order in which they appear. So that numeric thing is really important. Um, numbers go from one to N, numbers must be sequential and they can't have any gaps. So you can't pre-configure it and say, I'm gonna put 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, like you do field numbers. Um, it's gotta be one, two, three, four, five. Otherwise it just doesn't find them. Um, you can reuse a handler. So you could have a handler that gets used for one path and another path, that doesn't matter. And every web app, sorry, and I should say this is all configured at a web app level. So there's no web handlers configured for the whole application or for the whole instance, they're really configured per web app. Um, every web app has that default. So if I can't find a web handler, basically what am I gonna do? By default, in the um, development PASOE um, is the compatibility handler. 
So that will typically just return you a thing, web object not found, or unable to find a web object. I forget the exact text. Um, it could also be the default handler, depending on how you built the PaaS instance. Generally, it's going to be the compatibility handler. And generally, unless you have, if you don't have web speed, you should replace that. Um, one of the really nifty things about using the um, Open Edge properties method is that if you change the Open Edge properties, that takes immediate effect. So if you add one, you remove one, it just, there's no need to poke the server to say, hey, wake up, you've, I've changed the configuration. It monitors this list of handlers, or at least it reevaluates them on every request is probably more accurate way of putting it, and changes are immediately available. Cool, cool. So, by example, I've got five handlers down the bottom here, default and then one to five with various things. Um, how do we pick them? Um, so, for instance, we have a payroll service catalog. It's going to pick this first one. Um, data employee is going to pick that one, but not that one. Uh, payroll UI is going to pick none of them because there's no, there's no tokens, there's no um, UI there. Um, and as I say, the algorithm kind of works like a for each begins, if you can, if you want to think of it that way, by order. So um, you'll notice that this URL, the longer one with the more detail, is um, before earlier than the shorter one, and that's important. And that trips people up quite frequently. Um, if resources data were handler two it would have been resolved, not handler, not this one. And that can be important because these web handlers may depend on those tokens being there. They may depend on those variable names being there. Um, this is a challenge, can be a challenge. I mentioned I've seen um, handler configurations with hundreds of handlers. And even when you get into the tens, you know, if you've got 20 or 30 of them, it can get it can get tough potentially to figure out the order and you can run into problems saying, you know, um, which one actually was used, which one wasn't used. So that's, that, that can be a challenge to um, having these big, big, big lists of um, web handlers. Um, in 12.2, Progress introduced a alternate mechanism which looks a lot more, a lot closer to the par file approach used by the REST adapters and even the WISMs and the WIS um, used by SOAP. So it uses a JSON file per service. So in, in the, in the um, OpenEdge properties model, each web handler is its own thing, it's free to do with what it wants. There's no relation between them. There's no real grouping of them. Um, and in 12.2, um, Progress introduced this concept of of a service, if you will, for web handlers. Um, there is a um, JSON document. Um, it's got a service name, a version. 2.0 is the one you want to use. If you read this URL, there's a 1.0 and a 2.0. Stick with the 2.0, it's a little more sensible. Um, and basically, this says for this URI, right, this path, use this web handler and you can turn it on and off. Right. The order is determined because it's in a JSON array. So arrays are ordered, right? One, two, three, four, five. That's equivalent to what we had earlier. Um, and this file is now deployed into the web app. So previously, the Open Edge properties is in the instance. So it's in the conf directory. Now this goes into the web app in this folder, web inf adapters, um, in this case, root, root handlers. Um, the algorithms used is the same. It's just where it's stored is slightly different. Um, and the other big difference is that these are not immediately applied. You've got to poke the server and say, hey, update yourself. There's new, there's new web handlers to be used here. Yeah. Um, this root dot handlers is a special name, a special adapt, a special service. Um, and it's basically the Everything that goes from the root, we'll see in a sec. We can we can use this to break up the web handlers into services, um, but the root is a special one, and it's pretty much a one-on-one -on -one replacement. If you took all of those web handlers that you had configured, all of those two, three, whatever hundred, you could put them into a root handlers, and that would work just fine. Why would you want to use this approach? Well, 
the one nice thing is it allows you to segment your URL space nicely. So now we can say, kind of like the SOAP adapter, kind of like the REST adapter, we are now going to break our um, services into, or our web handers into service, into groups by service, right? So if you look at the bottom here, for instance, I can say um, this URL, everything under customer service is considered a service and we will work with those all together. So that lets us say, okay, customer service fits into, its, it's got its own set of web handlers and we're gonna bring those into its own dot handlers file. Um, why would we wanna do that? Well, A, it just makes it easier to work with, right? Instead of having these hundreds, we may now have five services of a hundred each instead of one massive service with 500 web handlers in it. Um, it makes figuring out where mistakes are a little easier, right? It's easier to pass through fewer things than it is to pass through many things. Um, so that's a way of doing that. We may also not deploy all of the services all the time. Um, the other huge benefit of using this JSON file approach is that um, if you are using tools to deploy stuff, I don't know how many of you have had the pleasure of trying to deploy um, extra services into, a, um, into an existing PaaS instance, but it can get really hairy, especially with the ordering challenges in the open edge properties file of trying to figure out i want to insert a web handler now at at handler 43 configuring that is challenging um, with scripts like by hand sure it's easy enough to do but you've still got to go down from 43 and renumber them all it gets it gets it gets difficult um, using this approach is much easier it's much easier to manipulate json in uh, programmatic fashion than it is those flat text files. So those are very cool ways of doing things. Um, all right. So um, I think just to start, I will just take a look at, oopsie, um, where is my, just an example of a web handler. We'll look at coding them in a sec. Um, but what I have here is, a request echo. So it's basically a um, it's a web handler that just responds with whatever you sent it. It just returns some information about the thing. We'll look at the details of it in a sec. Um, and right now it is in my it is in my um, instance. My instance is running here, um, running there. Uh, yes. um, so that's our kind of standard web approach, right? Um, I have to authenticate. We set up as a week to require authentication on this web app. Um, and I'm going to log in with a demo account. And if you can see that, hopefully, I'm able to run web object file, right? So. That is my standard configuration. None of the, the URL that I asked for didn't exist. So now I wanna add this echo in here, right? So I'm gonna look for an echo endpoint and it's saying there's nothing there. So for configuration, as I said, I can do it in one of two ways. Um, this project over here is my, um, is my PaaS instance. I look in the, boop, 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 boop. where'd it go? Open Edge Properties file over here. Hopefully you can see that. Um, and I can go and configure for the root web app, which is where I'm at, All right? You can see because there's nothing between the host and the slash web. In here, I'm going to add a web handler. So handler one is equal to request anchor handler colon slash anchor and save that. Um, you can see we saw by default we got that um, compatibility handler returned the, the web speed message. So we put that in. If I now go to the same endpoint, I will now get some data back. So as so I said, configuring it, it just adds it immediately. Um, I can see all of this stuff returned. Now this is obviously, well not obviously, this is a JSON response. Um, 
you can see a whole bunch of information came back. The information in here is less important, um, but we got some information here. Interesting. Um, um, yeah, so our, our web handler works. This is just returning JSON data, could return whatever. We could also, alternately, I'm just going to comment that guy out, add it into a handlers file. Um, and as I said, we use these already. Um, and we've used them as a replacement. So our standard framework stuff is here. Um, and to add one, we're going to add a new folder. We're going to call it the echo service. And in there, I'm just going to do the old copy pasta. And there we're going to say new file. And that's going to be echo.handlers. That closes there, and that closes there, and that closes there. And that's all good and well. Um, and in here, we're going to add our, our web handler. Okay, so the service name here is Echo. And what we're going to do is add our service relative to that. So what PAS will do is it will take this service name as part of the path plus this URI, whatever this might be. So we could add multiples in here. Um, And we could say something like that. Request echo handler. Just got these the wrong way around. Um, again, because at some point I'm going to want to show you how to do that, and I'm going to want it to use that token when it exists. So we can add multiple of them, right? Um, that's in the instance. And if we now run our URL again or our request again, it's going to say unable to find that because we've taken it out of the properties file and we haven't re added it in yet, that service. So to do that, we go to everyone's favorite tool and we go to up there, back there, into our command line and we say bin tc man jmx refresh web minus app name and stream and web app is root. All right, so what we're doing now is we're telling PaaS to update itself. And with luck, web app name and ta-da. So now we've updated it and now if we refresh, we get our web handler again. Okay, so the two kind of approaches. Again, this is very simple. This is a very simple, very limited set of them. Even our root web handlers, I don't know how many we've got in here. We can probably count them in um, in here. We've got 43 of them. It would be nice if we had 42, but just 43 of them. So not too many. And again, we could hypothetically, if we wanted to break this down. So these kind of resource would be one potentially a service. Again, how you this kind of goes to how you design your URL space, how you want to design your deployment for that URL space. We deploy them all, um, so we chose to have them in one root file. Okay, so deployment, fairly simple. Um, the, the web handler, um, I had it in the OpenEdge folder in this instance. This is just ProPath. This can be anywhere. So for instance, if I come back to our web handler, I'm going to just duplicate that tab and if I go to session info right this is our our ping basically or our heartbeat um, web handler this session info does not live in this instance it lives in ProPath somewhere so web handlers are cool they can just be in ProPath you can deploy them as part of your application you can deploy them into the instance if you want into the ProPath wherever that might be all hunky dory. Right. So, coding a web handler. So, a brief example there. Um, basically, the recommended approach, 
we talked about this already, use the Open Edge web, web handler. This is shipped by Progress. It has a whole bunch of nice things in it. Um, these methods, you're going to want to implement more. You don't have to handle them all. So for instance, if you don't, if you've got a, 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 a web handler that's read only, then you're going to only implement get and you're going to return errors from all of the other um, methods. Um, you, you may have post only, you know, or you may have a file upload service, for instance, which only accepts posts. Um, so there's way, you know, this lets you separate, although in the web handler, um, which methods you allow into that request. There's other ways of doing that. We'll take a look at that a little bit. But generally, you're going to start with a web handler and you're going to add stuff in there. Um, the signatures are all the same. They all look like this handle, get, put, post, whatever that might be. Um, very, very, fairly simple. This request object that you get in here now contains everything that you might need. Well, it contains everything that was sent to you with one notable, two notable exceptions. Um, the um, authorization header is stripped out by PaaS, as is the proxy authorization header. Um, and the thinking behind that is that security should be handled by the spring layer, we'll talk about security in a sec, um, rather than by the application, rather by the web handlers. Um, yeah, so, all right. Um, generally, the flow you're going to use, you're going to read the request in, right, parameters, the body, the content type, you look at accept header, um, you know, content negotiation in HTTP, any API keys, query strings, right? So, for instance, um, you may want to limit the amount of data to return, right? You may not want to return all 100 million transaction records, order records, whatever. Um, the next step then is to how do you decide what to run? So, that could be based on anything, really. Um, it could be based on the URL. My classic web speed had the program to run in the path. It could be based on hard coding. So you know I'm in the customer web, web handler, I'm going to run the customer service. It's a get, I'm going to run fetch method. It's a post, I'm going to run update, whatever the case may be. Do that and then return the values however you want it to do. So status codes, um, headers, right? So 200, you know, however you want to do that. An entity, um, the body um, is an entity. Um, or in the web handlers, they call them entities based on HTTP client, um, message body, payload, however you want to do it. And then the last bit is once you've created this object, you can write the response to the web, to the output stream. Um, and this is very similar to how WebSpeed does it. Write the response out. Um, it uses this object called the web response writer that sends it back to PaaS, PaaS sends it back to the client and everyone is happy. Uh, PaaS doesn't really touch the response on the way out, um, except it will use what's called HTTP chunking in certain, so, or by default really. Um, you can trigger that or, or not trigger that in, the, in, in how you send the response, um, but generally that's a standard HTTP 1.0, 1.0, 1.1, 1.1, thing. <clears throat> Not something you have to deal with in your code at all. Um, generally, you're going to want to follow this method. It's possible to start writing before you've finished running the business logic. So you would do something like read the request, run the business logic, and as you're as you're going, as it were, send you start sending your response back out again. That's possible, but you should only do that if you really are like 100% sure that it's actually going to succeed, that you're guaranteed of returning a success condition. So that means you catch errors, you do all those kinds of things. Because once you start sending it out, once you've sent your headers out, so let's say your header says um, status code 200 okay, and you're saying content type is application JSON, Right. Now you hit an error and you want to return an HTML page, something like that. Or you're returning, you're saying text HTML, but now you want to return JSON. 
that's gone. The client's got that already. You can't change it mid-flight. So generally, what you're going to want to do is to build a whole response and then send it back out, even if it is possible to do it that way. Um, again, the data you can get, we can look through this at your leisure, but the method, the post you get access to, you get the whole URL, you get pieces of the URL, um, you get you can kind of get all of this. You can get just the part after the web. You can get um, the template. So what did that what did that um, template look like? What did the uh, path parameters look like? Query names, etc. Headers, cookies, all of that sort of stuff. You can get from the request object. The URI template, as I mentioned, you can get those path info, content length, blah 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 blah, all of that sort of stuff. Um, Generally, when you get the body, there's an entity property on the request object. It will return you one of these three, um, progress JSON, JSON construct, or open edge core mempointer, open edge core widget handle for XML, for JSON, and for everything else. Um, it will just give you one of those. So if you want to handle different content types, you have to kind of Look at both the content type header or the content type property and also the type of data that's in there in 12.5 progress added a couple of um, methods that give you a bit better and by bit better i mean um, for instance if you have a um, mem pointer containing an image it might return you something to a different type or if you received a multi-part message it would return you a multi-part entity class or object rather than a mem pointer which you can then do other work on um, get raw entity gets you just the mem pointer as is so that's getting the data calling the business logic that's up to you as i mentioned the web handler is a service interface it shouldn't do it shouldn't do anything other than inspect the inspect the request perform some authorization run a service and return everything back Lots of times, especially in demo code and samples, you'll see, you know, a web handle reading the customer table or whatever. That shouldn't be like that in your application architecture. Um, whatever that might be, right? Read stuff on disk, um, update data, load, you know, whatever you choose to do, you can do in the business logic service. Building the response, very simple again. Um, there's a web response object. We can give it a status code to whatever we want. It doesn't matter, you know, 418, I'm a teapot, um, or 200, okay, which is the standard, 500 is an error, whatever, 404, not found. You can just do that in here. Um, set headers, you know, so uh, if you're creating a new um, resource, right, so you've created a new customer, um, it's somewhat of a standard to say, return 201 created and, um, send the location of where that newly created resource can be found so that the client can go fetch it if it wants to. Cookies, etc. cetera. Um, content negotiation is a thing you can now do. As I said, web handlers can receive um, both, um, web handlers can receive both um, well, many content types. And so you may decide to return data differently. Um, in fact, Pazoe does this with its error handling. If you have an accept header, that says from the client, I want to get data. I want to get my responses. JSON was HTML was XML. Now you can do um, some kind of um, content negotiation based on that. Um, so if a customer is asking for JSON, you send them JSON. If a customer is asking for um, XML, you send them XML, or you decide a default. Our web handlers um, for all of our RESTful services are all JSON based, and so we only return JSON. That we can say, hey, you you don't accept JSON. Um, it's possible to say, what do you accept or not, and return a 400 bad request error, or there's a status code for it that says, you know, I don't accept this content type, or I can't return this content type. Again, this web response writer, this is its kind of simplest way: open, close, pass it the response, open, close, and it writes data out. Um, the Important, well, the, 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 there are write methods. I mentioned you can send stuff piece by piece. This web response writer has a write method 
on it that will take stuff so you can send the response in pieces if you want to but generally you're going to do something like this 99% of the time the other thing that's important is this return zero and Pazo we is nice in that it lets you do a lot of coding yourself but for things like static pages you can return you can configure PAS to return um, we'll go into the errors part to return different errors based on a status code and so if you return a status code here if you return 404 or 500 or something like that then as a we will return the response and it won't it, it won't return your response so that's all good and well um, i mentioned configuring very many handlers to configure to handle very many endpoints and one of the one of the reasons you go down that route is to is because each of those web handlers is aware of the services it's routing the requests to so you might have a if you've got a banking api you might have an accounts endpoint and a customers endpoint and a transfers and a i don't know what else um withdrawals or whatever and each of those could be configured with very many endpoints and a web handler that kind of knows how to send that stuff send those requests to those individual classes generally the more complex the more we're well, not more complex but the the more you write web handlers, the more generic you tend to make them. You find you do a lot of work that's done again and again and again. Um, and you, you find that as the backend services run, you'll find that your web handlers will, one web handler will be able to send data or will land up sending requests to very many services. In this kind of world, what you're gonna want to look at is a dynamic approach. What do I mean by a dynamic approach? approach dynamic approach means that there's some form of markup or metadata if you will on those services that says for this request where are you going so the smart component library we have we use one web handler our rest entities web handler for all all restful data services if you will there's other web handlers to do things like swagger ui and um, repository based UI and those sort of things but for the data services that API layer pretty much uses one web handler and that consumes annotations on those services business entities in our case generally that say hey I'm exposing my my fetch is at this endpoint customers goes to slash customers or orders goes to slash order slash something slash customer whatever it might be um, and so we can reuse that web handler because it does it always does the same thing right it calls the same five methods if it is in the same way always there's no point in having very many web handlers to duplicate that functionality there's an example at that url if you want to see how we do that um but yeah so we have web handlers like this we have configured on this entities and customers slash one over here is now an endpoint um, we manage that configuration of one, two, three in, in the application, in our, in our annotations. And so we can then annotate um, services to say, here's a record that's a single record, a collection is a set of records, all customers, one customer, whatever, and some metadata about what we want to return. This is really nice, having it as annotations, um, because the metadata is visible next to the actual code um, if you look at something progress has a somewhat similar um, approach with the um, data object handler that also uses metadata but it is not annotation driven so you kind of go know where the where the metadata is and look at it next to the code so it's nice having annotations next to the code hopefully progress will give us all um, strongly typed annotations or annotations in R code soon. They've been, um, and that would mean that this is, becomes even more powerful. Right now, we have to read the code, pull the annotations out, put them in a different, put them in a in a different file somewhere, and then consume that. It gets a little bit, it's a bit painful having to do these steps. But 
when we've got these kind of annotations as dynamic approaches possible. And as I say, generally, when you start going down the road of developing web handlers, you're going to get to a point where you hit, okay, uh, it's getting a bit overwhelming here. I'm going to go into some kind of a dynamic approach. Cool. Um, I'm just looking at my time over here. I will, I will circle back to the coding in a sec. Um, the other bit I mentioned earlier, um, kind of related to those web handlers on um, responding to requests it didn't want, right? So there was the handle not, there were these, uh, there was the default web handler, which I can, um, default web handler, and this just, for everything, just does um, pretty much a handle not implemented, returns that status code, um, always. And that's going to be a, f I don't remember what this one is. It's where I'd know it. I'd looked at it about a thousand times. Um, what did we say that was? That was not implemented. Um, and not implemented is a, do, 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 do. Where is not implemented. There we go, 501, right? Always returns a 501, but we may want to do more than that, or we may want to control things better than that, not have it get all the way into the ABL before we block something. That's kind of where authorization comes in. So PaaS uses Spring Security. It's an open source security thing for authorization and authentication. And every single request, even if it's too anonymous, if the configuration is not, security is configured to be anonymous, it goes through Spring. Every single request, regardless of the client, ABL client, web client, REST client, SOAP client, all of them. Um, authentication, we're not going to talk on. You can configure it at the web app or the ABL application instance level, also in your Open Edge install. There's kind of those five layers, um, and we're just going to assume that you are authenticated at, for authorization. The authorization Spring provides is role based. So when we log on, when we get a client principle, when we get a, a Spring token, there are roles associated with that user identity. Um, for OAuth 2 type or JWT type um, authentication, authorization, it's scope-based authorities rather than roles. Um, this gets configured only at the web app level in one of those two files. The CSV is used for pretty much everything but JWTs in that file over there. So what do these look like? Again, pretty standard text files, which is great. Um, and they basically map um, URL slices. You'll notice it's slash rest rather than after the transports or the transports are in here. Um, so there's a URL path. There's a, this, an option here for the method, the HTTP method, um, and then some form of expression. Spring access expression or Spring expression language. Um, and so you can see for REST endpoints, we accept this particular file, accept all URLs, and um, or, or on all URLs, you need to have that particular role. So these roles you can configure in here. Um, the determination of whether it's got a role in front of its all other properties. But in this particular case over here, we say, well, in web star star, if you're a PSC user, if you're web execute ABL, you've got to have that administrative role. Right. So I have a, you know, um, in my login over here, um, oopsie, and that can kind of express itself in, um, just log into our back office administration. If I look at our developer tools, Right, so we have a um, a web handler. Oops, where did it go? It was in the slide. Um, execute ABL. That's our Dojo implementation, um, which is over here. Um, I'm just a demo user. I don't have any special privileges. If I try to run this, it's going to say forbidden. Right, forbidden is the error that comes back from failing this rule over here. So this is can be done in ABL code, of course. We can we can query the client principle in the in the web handler. 
where you can say, am I allowed to execute that? That can be done there too. It's a little step into the application rather than at the spring side where this gets bounced before it even hits any ABL code. Um, so there's a bunch of things you can do here. Things important here to note are this is top down as well. So kind of like the web handlers configuration is, works from the top down. So if you have a broader URL above a more narrow one, it's going to execute that one first, right? So if this rule was above this rule, I would have been able to see that. Um, similarly, things it can look at has roles. There's a list of roles. Um, authorities are what the JWT's authorization uses. Um, and we can permit and deny. We can see if somebody's anonymous, is somebody logged in, right? So we could say, we'll let people get into slash web as long as they're logged in. It doesn't matter what role they have, just they need to be logged in. Um, and then generally, as it trickles down, you want to limit access to everything. The kind of token here is an ant-like token or ant-like regex expression slash star star means here and everything down. If it was a single star, it would just be in that rest resource. Everything below that would get passed through. This is, in my experience, underused. People tend to just leave it alone, leave the defaults, comment it out, and um, just implement the authorization in the application, which is valid, like I said. but you are letting a request come in to the application and really it's a good practice to reject known bad things as early as possible before it gets too far into the application. All right, we'll finish off with errors. Um, so application errors can be done in a number of ways. One, it can just be another response, right? As I said, we can build a complete response and make it look like anything, right? It, it can be JSON, it can be HTML. Um, we could say 404 not found, we could say 418, I'm a teapot, whatever. However you want to do that, build it, build it particularly like you want. Um, if you want to return errors that, um, that have stack traces in them or have more detailed developer style in errors, then you're probably gonna wanna build the stuff yourself because you're gonna wanna put all of that data in there. So build a JSON blob, build an XML document, return a zero, you know, send it to the response stream, return zero, easy peasy. You can also return static error pages. And I mentioned this earlier when I talked about returning an integer value from that web handler method. So when, when you return that integer value, um, PAS looks to see if there's an error page configured for it in the web xml file per web app um, and does returns whatever that page is um, the one thing it does nicely is that it returns at, um, queries on the accept header so it will either return html which it looks something like this or it will return a json blob which is the next page or the next slide the one cool thing about using these static pages is a they well, they're somewhat static, somewhat dynamic, right? Some of this data is from the request, um, but you can tailor them. So if you've got a look and feel, we've tailored, we've tailored in the smart component library, we've tailored our error pages to have our color, our color scheme, our fonts, that sort of stuff. So you can make those static pages just look good. So if you're an ISV and you've got multiple customers, each, each customer could have their own different um, tailoring for these error pages done statically without a developer, without some poor harmless ABL programmer has to go and write um, HTML code and inject CSS and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. So a way of doing that. Um, again, if you ask for JSON, it will send you JSON back. This is similar data to what was in the earlier page, but in a JSON blob. Right. Um, you could also mix and match, right? So, for instance, um, if accept value is JSON, we can say, okay, we can build you a JSON blob because we're going to put all of those error stack traces in there. We're going to put that whole call stack in. Otherwise, if you're a web page asking, we're just going to send you a 500 back, no, and, and send the default page back. 
So the web handles are really nice from that point of view that you can make, you're not boxed in, you're not limited into always sending the same stuff back because you've got access to the AVL, because you can write the code to go and modify things. You can say, okay, you know, this could say if accept value is JSON and um, the user has a role of application developer or there's a query string with question mark debug on it or something like that. I'm going to then send them back all the states, all of the um, all of the stack traces and all of that sort of stuff. But otherwise, I'm just going to send them a 500 and tell them to leave me alone. So different different ways of deciding what you're going to send back. You don't have to always send back the same thing. You can make intelligent decisions based on the request as well. All right. So in general, web handlers, um, as I said, they they are really, as I said, really good. I like them. They're ABL. It's really good. We can build JSON APIs. We can build uh, XML. We can serve um, UI data. Um, the beauty of them as well is they can be as focused or as general as you want. So I mentioned kind of these dynamic um, web handlers that read some kind of a metadata on business services and know how to do that. On the other hand, you can have a very single focused um, web handler. So our session info web handler that I showed you a bit earlier, that just does one thing. It only does session info. It doesn't do any metadata reading or writing. It just says, I'm going to do that. Um, errors let you blend those static and dynamic responses. And again, generally with the code, you can do a lot of that. Um, and the other big benefit of PASOE is that you can add those URL paths piece by piece. So if you've got some kind of a classic web speed application, you can say these screens, these forms are going to be, have their data returned by um, these particular web handlers, not by classic web speed. So that's really, really good in that regard. Um, yeah, there's a bunch more um, to talk about in terms of authentication in particular. More and more people are using OAuth-based stuff. PaaS helps you with that. Not so much, not necessarily web handlers. Um, authorization though is a big thing that people don't tend to use, but you can then add authorization there. If you do authorize those pages, um, they will tie into the um, they will tie into the um, static error pages, so you can get a nicely formatted page back. Um, so yeah, generally, they are still good. Um, we're doing on time, not too bad today. Right. So with that, that was the end of that. Um, are there any questions, Marco, or anybody else? Nope. Nope. Well, no, no question. No question so far. Good. Um, I could keep going. I can always keep going. Um, I know you could. I know, you, know, you know I could. Um, I'm just trying to think if there is a. So that's not this one. Yeah. So this ping request. So one of the one of the things. Yeah, I will stop here. I, 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 will, I will just say one more thing. Um, in terms of the, um, in terms of the, uh, in terms of web handler selection, um, I should just note. I will just bump up the logging a little bit of this. Um, um, I'm logging level that up a bit um, and make a couple of requests. One of the one of the um, I'm just going to make a couple of requests. One of the things that's available to you in the um, log files, if you have it configured just so. Is the ability to see I'll make that bigger at the bottom here this should tell us should tell us 
but it's not doing it right now, um, which web handler was run. So there's a log message that gets generated out and it's not in here yet. Um, that gets generated to say this was the this was the um, 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 URL path that was used to select this web handler. So that can be really useful for debugging that sort of stuff if you run into it. Okay, well then I will, if there are no further questions, if you have other questions, feel free to email me. Um, my email is at the, was at the beginning, um, peter.judge at consultingwork.com or info at consultingwork.com if you have further questions. Um, and yeah, with that, I wish you all a good afternoon, evening. Have a good day. Thank you.